Hi everyone, second day of the week, Tuesday with our TNT. A quick whip around of the main news stories from around Thailand, a few from around the region. We do this five days a week, Monday to Friday. If you get a moment, quickly just subscribe to the channel, give us a like. Let's get started with the news. Well, starting today with a joyous event, and it's congratulations to Patong Tan Shinawat, who gave birth to her second child. Patong Tan Shinawat, one of the uh, prime ministerial candidates for the Per Thai Party, and of course, daughter of former self exiled Prime Minister Taksin Shinawat. There she is with Dad and the new baby. Let's find out some more. And Thai PBS World reporting that Per Thai Party's Prime Ministerial candidate, Patong Tan Shinawat, gave birth to her second child yesterday and said she'll return to the campaign trail as soon as she's recuperated. And the boy's been named Pruta Sin Suksawas, nicknamed Tasin. Meanwhile, her father, the exiled former PM Taksin, tweeted a message saying he's very happy to have his seventh grandchild, adding that he'll be 74 in July and would like to seek permission to return to Thailand to raise his children. He ended his message, see you soon. Well, clearly that message designed to get under the skin of uh, conservatives in Thailand. Uh, whilst, of course, welcoming his seventh child. Let's have a look at the Instagram message from Patong Tan. And she typed, Sawadi Krab, my name is Prut Tasin Suksawas, nicknamed Tasin. Thanks for the moral support from everyone in the next couple of days. When mum regains her strength, she will meet with the media. Be interesting to see how Patong Tan and Per Thai perhaps leverage this story to their advantage in the last two weeks of the election. How do you think it may play out in the minds of Thai voters? Maybe female voters might think, oh, a new baby. Oh, I'll vote for her. Anyway, we'll be interesting to see if it does seem to resonate in the polls as we lead up to the election on May the 14th. What else is happening in the world of elections? Well, Thai PBS World say that the Election Commission is under fire over poor regulation of populist campaign policies. What well, seems over the past couple of weeks, just about every party's been rolling out some sort of pork barreling, promising more wages, uh, handouts, stimulus packages, in uh, order to try and break out of the white noise of the election and get people, of course, to vote for their party. Heaven knows if you drive around Thailand, there's these vans driving around with loudspeakers with noise and campaign slogans and songs, none of which I understand, but uh, the election campaign's getting pretty noisy and all the streets, of course, lined with those flimsy campaign uh, posters that get blown over with about five knots of wind. But the uh, Thailand Development Research Institute has criticised the Election Commission for its failure to check whether populist campaign policies promised by political parties in their election manifestos are worth the huge spending. So usually the questions are, where's the money coming from? How much will it cost? And if the parties can show that, then they seem to get passed. The country's economic think tank has made a number of observations about these policies. They say that some of the parties have not explained in their reports to the Election Commission or to the public about the sources of funding. In the next paragraph, several parties have announced that they will make use of the annual budget to implement their campaign policies. Oh, it'll just be included in the annual budget. Everything's OK. While some parties say they will source their funding from tax increases, but don't specify what taxes would be increased or by how much. And another observation is that most parties only talk about the positive aspects of their campaign policies, but do not mention the downsides or the high risks, despite the fact that the policies would require massive levels of funding. I really don't think that uh, Thai politics or politicians are any different from politicians around the world. And yes, there are bodies which are there to try and make sure they keep their promises, but there's nothing new about politicians throwing money out during a campaign and then somehow wriggling out of them during their actual time in office. But there is a process in place. The Election Commission's meant to do that, but this Thai PBS article suggests that uh, perhaps some of them need to do some more explaining. That article in Thai PBS World, it does go through the different parties and the promises they're making in the lead up to the election. 
It's our Tuesday TNT. All I can see outside is blue sky. We've got light winds here in Phuket. Top temperature of about 32 degrees. If you're interested, the air is cleaning up and we've sort of got these storms developing during the afternoon, some of which drop some rain, some that don't. So certainly looks like we're heading into more of a wet season routine now. Let's move on. And this is the latest in the Am Cyanide case. The Bangkok Post reporting mother of alleged 15th victim of Am Cyanide meets investigators. And there she is. That's probably the best photo we've seen of her. Such an innocent looking woman, but uh, may be behind one of the biggest serial killing cases in Thailand. The mother of a woman who died in Bangkok seven years ago and is suspected to be the 15th cyanide poisoning victim of Am Cyanide met the CSD police yesterday. And this I found interesting. The woman gave police information about her daughter, who was 37, who died in Bangkok seven years ago. She reportedly told police she personally thought it was Ms. Sararat who caused the death of her daughter, although she had no evidence to substantiate the belief. So this is sort of strange. If you've lost a loved one in the last 10 years, do you automatically assume that it's am cyanide that caused it? So I'm not sure if there's going to be a lot of people wasting police time uh, because, as she says, she's got no evidence. So why did she go to police? Why does she think it was am cyanide? And indeed, why did the Bangkok Post go and report it, naming it as the potential 15th victim? That's from the BangkokPost.com, and this is from Facebook. We've crossed out the name of the poster. This person obviously very concerned about the alcohol bans coming up and says no alcohol sales due to the elections, and that'll be from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. on May the 6th to May the 7th. So that's this weekend. It's sort of a pre-polling day. So from 6 p.m. on the 6th to 6 p.m. on the 7th, There'll be no alcohol sales. And also May the 13th and the 14th, same thing from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. That's the actual election day next week. Also Buddha Day, June the 3rd, which coincides apparently with the FA Cup final. No alcohol sales from midnight on the 2nd of June until midnight on the 3rd of June. So if that concerns you, they're the dates, they're the times you probably need to stock up if you absolutely can't do without alcohol for a day. Moving on, and we go to Patia and the PatiaNews.com. Patia Beach Hotels and Bars benefited from the crew of the USS Nimitz. Somebody wrote to me last week and said, hey, what happened to that visit of the US Strike Force? Well, looks like they had a good time in Patia. And several Patia beachside resorts, bars and hotels benefited from the arrival of crew members of the US Nimitz Carrier Strike Group, according to the Chairman of the Tourism Industry Council of Jombri. And the USS Nimitz Carrier Strike Group, led by the aircraft carrier USS Nimitz, and I mentioned last week that I've been on the USS Nimitz, I was doing a news program from the deck of the Nimitz in Phuket some, I don't know, eight or nine years ago. And they've been engaged in an extensive 11-month patrol mission within the U.S. 7th Fleet Area of Operations since November last year. Recently, the group had completed joint drills with Japan and South Korea and has also passed through disputed parts of the South China Sea without any problems. So several hotels located on the Patia beachfront had benefited from the arrival of the US military. The arrival created quite a buzz around Beach Road and helped boost tourism during April the 24th to the 28th. And Walking Street in particular was very busy with US military members on a break all last week. Head to the nation now, another story in Patia. And 83 Indian tourists land in jail over gambling charges in Patia. So a bogus casino gone wrong. Let's find out more. Chombury police arrested 83 Indian tourists early yesterday for allegedly playing card games for money in a convention hall of a Patia hotel. And the raid happened after midnight on Monday. Also led to the arrests of four Thai men, two Thai women and four Myanmar women who were serving as card dealers. When police arrived, they found 83 Indians, 71 of them men, playing Baccarat and Blackjack. Inside the hall, police found 25 sets of cards, 160,000 Indian rupees in cash. 
92 mobile phones, three notebook computers, three car dispensers and chips and a partridge in a pear tree. Uh, Police believe that about one billion rupees were circulated in the makeshift casino. And there we go, the uh, police just checking out all the paraphernalia. Yes, definitely a casino. I don't think they can say, oh no, nothing going on here. And a Thai woman who's 32 reportedly confessed to organising gambling trips for the Indian tourists. She said they were charged 50,000 baht each, which covered airfares, food, airport to hotel transfers, as well as hotel rooms. She said she'd instructed the hotel to keep the convention hall off limits for its staff. Shh, don't tell anyone. And down the bottom, all 93 are at the Patia police station to face charges. And there's some more photos of the raid. And the Patia male, a little less sympathetic about the whole thing, saying the naivety of Patia's card gamblers from India is gobsmacking. And they report that the raid on the Asia Patia Hotel netted around 80 gamblers from India and an assortment of Thai and Myanmar card dealers tour organisers and money counters. It's difficult, they say, to envisage a more bungled and chaotic gambling holiday, which was bound to result in tears and worse. They editorialise. They go on. Astonishingly, the arrested gamblers included several Indian businessmen with high profiles. And it goes on to name a few of them and their relative positions and nationalities. And at the police station, some of the arrested even tried to argue that gambling in Thailand was now legal and there was a state lottery with betting also allowed on horse racing. Yeah, you tell that to the police, that'll change their mind. And it finishes by saying criminal lawyers in Patia say that the most likely penalty for the Indian gamblers will be a stiff fine, deportation and blacklisting. The Thai organisers could face other charges, but the saga pinpoints the reality that Patia 30 years ago may have been a wild west town with an anything goes reputation. It isn't now. And that in the Patia Mail, somewhat of a editorial mixed in with a new story. You're watching TNT, and we thank our sponsors, Five Star Marine. Well, it looks like I've missed the boat, but if you're interested in going on a private tour to any of the beautiful beaches or the islands off Phuket, I can highly recommend Five Star Marine. Now, I'll put a link in the description of this video if you'd like to find out more and make a booking. Moving on with the program, and this from Thai PBS World, Asia Pacific Tourism Industry to surpass pre-pandemic peak in 2025. Travel experiences in Asia Pacific have returned to rapid growth since the region reopened borders for regional and long-haul travel. However, the industry, especially tour activities and attractions, is expected to surpass the pre-pandemic peak in, well, two years' time, according to research conducted by Arrival Co. And the Arrival Co CEO is quoted as saying the Asia-Pacific region has borne the worst of the pandemic with a broad regional shutdown in cross-border travel well beyond other parts of the world. But demand for travel in the region is now accelerating as many borders have reopened, encouraging travellers to return. As we see when other regions reopened, travellers put experiences first in travel planning and spending. The challenge now will be for the global industry to get ready for the rapid influx of demand from across Asia Pacific. The story goes on to say that online bookings will surpass 30% of all tours, activities and attraction bookings worldwide in 2025, up from 17% in 2019. So Arrival Co talking it up, saying that bookings and stuff will be up in two years' time, 17% of what it was back in the previous record year in 2019. And Quimby said the experience-hungry cohort of Gen Z and millennial travellers in Asia are putting experiences first, and they're willing to pay for it. Therefore, the tourism operators must be ready to respond to the group. It also means more small group, immersive experiences that get travellers off the beaten track. There's no doubt there's been a sort of a quantum shift in the tourism industry and things are just going to be different in the future. 
things like the traditional hotels, well, people seem to be moving away from them and moving to more of an experiential type of visit instead. Uh, things like Airbnb continue to grow. So these are some of the trends that are definitely happening. And this article goes on to say, Thailand is enjoying growth, but still far from achieving the pre-COVID peak, notwithstanding the current slow increase. Last week, the Bank of Thailand raised its projections for foreign tourist arrivals to 25.5 million this year and 34 million next year. That's up from 22 and 31 million respectively. The country received a record of nearly 40 million visitors in pre-pandemic 2019. It's probably time to stop looking back at 2019 and hoping that everything's just going to fall in place and return to that record year. The travel patterns are quite different. The people that are coming to Thailand are different. The amount of time they're staying are different. Uh, the, the countries they're coming from are different. Everything has changed. And rather than looking back at the past and thinking, well, we're somehow going to get back to that, we need to look to the future, look at the current situation, assess how that's working, and see how we can work around these new markets that are now traveling to Thailand. Things are just different. I mean, I, I looked at airfares yesterday to go to Bangkok. And I looked over the next two weeks, the cheapest airfare I could find, remembering that I used to be able to fly to Bangkok from Phuket for about 800 to 1,000 baht, getting the cheap seats. Well, now the cheapest airfares I can get are three to 4,000 baht, and that's even out uh, two weeks away from my flight time. So, uh, yeah, things are just definitely different. I cancelled my trip to Bangkok next week because it's simply too expensive. I'm not going to go on a bus and I'm not going to drive there. I've done a few trips to, in a car over the recent months. And whilst it's a good drive, it's uh, also taking quite a lot of time. That's all we've got uh, time for today. Thank you for joining us on our TNT on Tuesday. If you get an opportunity to subscribe, that's great. Now, I also posted a quick post in the community section of the TNT channel yesterday asking people to throw some questions or comments or topics to Steve and me for our Grumpy Old Men program. I think we've already got enough subject matter for the next three months. But uh, thanks to all those people that have thrown their ore in the water. And uh, we'll see how Steve and I go trying to get through all those. Thanks for watching today. Hope you have a fantastic Tuesday. And we'll see you next time.